real quick. So. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kyla Hannington, and I'm the Public Engagement and Outreach Division Manager with the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights, your county's civil and human rights education and enforcement agency. This year, 2022, marks the 50th year our, count, our county agency was founded, and we are happy you have joined us tonight for one of the Office of Human Rights' many 50th anniversary celebration events. As we celebrate 50 years serving the residents of our area, we look to the legacy of Teresa Douglas Banks, who passionately advocated for the formation of our office back in 1971 and 1972. She was a community advocate, a civil servant, an educator, active in her church, in her neighborhood, in her region, and we see her life of service and commitment to equity as guiding principles for our own work. And it is an honor to continue in the work that she began. So tonight for our conversation, I'm joined by Renee Battlebrooks, the Executive Director of the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights. As we partner with our good friends, the Prince George's County Memorial Library System and New South Books to bring you Wanda Smalls Lloyd in conversation about her memoir, Coming Full Circle from Jim Crow to Journalism. Wanda Smalls Lloyd is the author of Coming Full Circle, a memoir published just before the pandemic in 2020 by New South Books. She writes of growing up in segregated Savannah under the restrictive period of Jim Crow laws, yet daring to become a daily newspaper journalist. The memoir is named by the Georgia Center for the Book as one of the books all Georgians should read in 2021. Shortly after publication of Coming Full Circle, she published another book as co-editor with novelist Tina McElroy Ansa, Meeting at the Table, African-American Women Write on Race, Culture, and Community is an anthology of essays conceived and published in 2020, shortly after the death of George Floyd. A retired newspaper editor with experience at seven daily newspapers, including the Washington Post and USA Today, Wanda retired from daily journalism in 2013 as executive editor of the Montgomery Advertiser in Alabama. She returned to Savannah to accept the position of chair and associate professor in the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at Savannah State University. She was the founding executive director of the Freedom Forum Diversity Institute at Vanderbilt University, a program to train non-traditional students for professional newsroom careers. In 2019, Wanda was inducted into the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame. She earned a BA degree in English at Spelman College in Atlanta, on whose board of trustees she served for almost 20 years. In 2016, Spelman awarded her the Honorary Doctor of Humane Letters. Wanda writes a twice monthly opinion column for savannahnow.com and the Savannah Morning News, her hometown newspaper. She also co-hosts a podcast with Tina McElroy Ansa, her co-editor and friend who she met more than 50 years ago when they were freshman year roommates at Smallman College. So welcome Wanda, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thank you so much, it's great to be here. Oh, we are thrilled, thrilled to have you and to really talk for the next few moments about uh, this amazing book coming full circle. So for those who may not have had the opportunity to purchase it or to borrow it from the library, perhaps you could just um, frame our discussion for those. Sure, I'd be happy to. It's so good to be here. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So uh, my mem it's a memoir coming full circle from Jim Crow to journalism is about my life growing up in the Jim Crow era. It's uh, the beginning of my passion for journalism during that period when I was a student in high school. I took a journalism class. My teacher recognized uh, leadership abilities in me as well as writing talent and appointed me to be the editor of our high school paper the next year, our senior year. And so really my journalism career started when I was in high school. And I decided in high school in 11th grade that I was gonna become a daily newspaper journalist. I had no idea the hills I would have to climb for that. I had no idea, for example, that, I, that there were not many, if any at that time, black women working in daily journalism in, in newspapers. Um, there were no women 
and no women of color that I knew of working at my local hometown paper. And there certainly were no women on the air on television in that, in that time. There were not even any women, I don't believe, I've not heard of any behind the scenes in, in television. But I dared to become a daily newspaper journalist anyway. And so this book chronicles my life coming out of that era of Jim Crow at a period where we were told where we could go to school, what kind of books we could have, um, where we could maybe eat, what neighborhoods we lived in, um, how we went shopping downtown, all those restrictive laws that prevented us from doing a lot of things that other citizens could do, and how I overcame that and dared to become a daily newspaper journalist working at seven daily newspapers across the country. I uh, always was an editor. I started as a copy editor. I've never been a full-time reporter. I, I was editor of my, high, my um, college paper at Spelman College in my senior year, and my career just went on from there. You, you weave such a beautiful note of hope and, um, and uh, more than hope, it's, it's like you can do it throughout the whole book without actually saying those words. But you know, it is possible for each of us to achieve even the dreams we don't know that we have, right? Um, and so I was struck uh, one thing uh, when I read, uh, it was probably in the first chapter, maybe the preface, but in 2013, in 2013, so that's like yesterday, really, mm -hmm. right? That you were one of four, one of four African-American women leading the newsroom of more than 1,000 U.S. dailies. Like, that is mind-boggling still, 2013. Um, and so uh, if you could talk a little bit about sort of the pink ghetto, as you call it. Well, yeah, in 2013, when I left my last daily newsroom, I was executive editor in, at the Montgomery Advertiser. I was one of four, and I write in the book that then there were three. That's right. Right. <laughs> that, that, that's a fact. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, two of us at the time of the four were graduates of Spelman College. We weren't there at the same time, but we were both graduates of Spelman College, which itself is interesting because Spelman doesn't have a journalism program. We, we we made I know I majored in English I'm not sure what uh, what my colleague majored in but this pink ghetto was it was real I mean I don't know that we called it a pink ghetto at the time it certainly was a ghetto mm -hmm. um, it was difficult for women to rise through the ranks when I came into the business there were very few women when I went to my first newsroom in Providence Rhode Island I recall that there was one other woman in the newsroom in a professional position there were clerical people, dictate people who took dictation from reporters out in the field. But I believe she was a religion reporter. And so it was difficult for me to see myself rising through the ranks and becoming a top editor because I just didn't see anyone who looked like me, but that didn't, that didn't stop me. I was the only person of color in the newsroom, of only African-American in the newsroom at the time. Um, there were some internationals in the newsroom, but I don't recall call that there were Hispanic or African-American at the time. And so it was difficult to see myself, but I have to tell you, it wasn't as hard for me as it is for some people today. And the reason is I came in right on the cusp of the civil rights movement demanding that newspapers bring more people of color, specifically African-Americans into newspaper newsrooms demanding that because of what happened in 1968, um, the riots after the death of Martin Luther King, because of the Kerner Commission that President Johnson um, uh, put in place to help determine why those riots happened. And, a lot, and the Kerner Commission report said that a lot of the large part of the reason for the riots was because we were living in two societies, one black and one white, and that the media was largely responsible for that division, that chasm. And so newspapers were really trying to figure out how to make this happen. And the problem was at that time that there were no very few people of color in the pipeline, very few of us in journalism programs, very few of us studying or getting ready for journalism careers. And so even those larger newspapers that wanted to make this happen found it difficult 
because they had trouble finding people. So I came in sort of, I guess you'd say at the right time, because there was a lot of demand for people who looked like me. And, and that really played a large part in my ability to rise in, in the field. You know, it's funny that we think we have progressed so far and we have, but, you know, we, we just keep sort of repeating these cycles. Um, I was struck, you know, you talk about building pipelines and and really uh, being intentional about that. I love the story in the book where you talk about um, when you came home from college and your grandmother made you go to every house on the street and how they pressed, you know, that dollar bill or whatever in your hand and, and your feelings. If you could explain that to our viewers and and talk about why that's important from, from all aspects. And is that something that we're missing today, whether it's that exact thing that it symbolizes or whether there's something else that kind of, you know, this, it takes a village or, you know, we are responsible for each other. But just speak to that. That is such a beautiful story. Well, thank you. That That is exactly what it was. It was a story about my village. And my village included people in my neighborhood, people in my church. Of course, the teachers that we had in our all-Black schools, of course, our family members. But this neighborhood was a strong support for young people like me. The people in the neighborhood invested in us, even though most of them did not have a college education. Some of them probably did not even finish high school, but they saw the future in us. And they demanded as we were growing up, they wanted to see our report cards. They were proud of us. They, you know, they would count the A's and say, you know, go, go, that's great, baby. You keep, you know, you keep striving, you keep doing well in, in your classes. That's important. They knew the value of education because many of them did not have that kind of the education that they wanted for us. And so when my, and, and if they saw us doing anything wrong in the neighborhood on the way home from school or just outside playing, they would always chastise us. And it wasn't like the day when a lot of parents don't want you to chastise their children. They had permission to chastise us because it really, because of this village atmosphere. And so when I went, uh, came home from college on a break, my grandmother said to me, I want you to go to each house on the block and I want you to knock on the door and ask Miss Pinckney and Miss Odessa and Miss Walker and Miss Colbert and Miss Johnson, I mean, all the names that I still remember and tell, tell them, you know, knock on the door and tell them how you're doing in school because they keep asking about you. How's Wanda? How's the baby doing in school? What's she learning up there at Spelman College? Does she like it? Is she having a good time? And it was very important for my grandmother to, to make sure that I went around to the houses. And as I did, and a lot of these women were, um, I guess we called them housewives at the time. They were home during the day and they all came to the door with a little apron on. And they would reach in their pocket and pull a dollar or two out of the apron, which was a lot of money back in the late 60s. And they would press it in my hand and say, here, baby, you take this dollar because you've been so good. You, you deserve this money. And I remember going home and saying to my grandmother, and, you know, we were, we were doing okay. We were definitely a middle class black family, not middle class by all standards, but definitely black family. My, we owned a business. Uh, actually, we own two businesses. My grandmother owned a business. My dad owned a business. My aunt, my aunt who raised me was um, a teacher. And I said, we don't really need their money. She said, no, we don't need their money. But this is important to them because they feel like you're one of them. And you need to, to continue to help them understand that what they did with you as a child is an investment in your future. Do you, do you think we're missing that? key component in our society today, however we define our village, you know, because we just seemed a bit lost. I mean, we as people now, I'm not just saying, you know, any particular group, but as a society, we just seem a bit lost. You know, I was looking at a social media post today and, and I don't remember what it was about, but it had something to do with neighbors. And I remember seeing one person comment I've lived in my house. I, I don't even know this person. I don't even know what state they live in. She said, I, I've lived in my house, I think she said, eight years, and I don't know a neighbor on my street. Wow. 
Isn't that sad? It, it is. It's, it's an indictment upon us. Yes. It really is because as I was growing up, we would run outside and play all the time. We were on our bicycles. We were on our skates. We were playing hot, hopscotch along the sidewalks. Most people in my neighborhood did not have a car. And so they were walking up the, down the street to go to the corner and get on the bus. And they would mm-hmm. stop and speak along the way. And we got to know everyone. And now we live in some neighborhoods where we don't know everyone. Yeah. And and that really is kind of um, a sad commentary. I understand it in some ways because there are more dangers out there, but it really is a sad commentary. Yeah. Um, Kyla, I don't want to take all the questions. No, no, we won't continue. But I do have one. And you mentioned your family growing up. And I feel like this is a good time to ask this one or to talk about this. You know, we see you really choosing your own family as a child you talk as an eight-year-old and I think of this as I mean it was such a powerful and empowering moment and again for people who haven't um read the book yet if you could tell us about that because I also think it sets a tone for your future too for how you you approach your own life yeah you know it's a complicated family story and so I tell people what sometimes when I read from my book uh, Gloria was my mother, but I called her Gloria because I thought she was my sister for a long time. She was separated. She, my parents were married bef- just before I was born, but they were separated and later divorced. Um, I chose, my grandmother raised me from the time my mother left Savannah. She left when I was very, very young. And so I called my grandmother mother for a long time because I thought she was my mother because I assumed that my mother was my sister, if that makes any sense. And then at some point I was called, um, my grandmother and my mother were called to go to Columbus, Ohio to help take care of my uncle uh, and his four children when his wife uh, needed to go back to school and get her nursing degree. And so when I went to Columbus, I lived with my four cousins and my uncle and my mother and my grandmother in this big old house in Columbus, Ohio for a time. And um, we came back to Savannah for the summer, just for the summer. And I thought, I was I had just turned eight years old, and I thought that we were back for good. Nobody told me we were going back to Columbus, Ohio. And when I found out that they were packing my stuff up in the car and we were going back to Columbus, I went, uh-uh, I do not want to go back to Columbus, Ohio. I was used to being an only child in Savannah, living with my grandmother. I was used to, of course, you know, warmer weather. Uh, yeah. I... I had friends on the block in my neighborhood. I didn't know those people in Columbus <laughs> outside of the house. And so I was not having it. My aunt and my uncle, who was my mother's sister and her husband, were building a beautiful brick house next door to my grandmother's house. My grandmother, like a lot of t- uh, people in the South, grandparents would give the children some land next door so they could build a house so that somebody could stay behind and I guess take care of them in their old age, which is exactly what happened. And I saw this house which was almost completed uh, next door to my grandmother's house. And I saw these kids running around the car as they were packing and putting my stuff in the car. And I took my aunt and uncle up on the steps and up, up the steps to my grandmother's porch. And we sat in the porch swing and I said, you don't have any children, do you? And I knew the answer. And the, and the answer, of course, was no, we don't have any children. Would you like to have a child? I said, and they they made it happen. We went down, we told my mother I wasn't going to go back with them. And they thought I was kidding. My mother and my grandmother, you know, they were saying something like, get in the car, girl. We don't, you know, they didn't want to believe me, but I was dead serious about it. And so that's how I ended up staying in Savannah for the rest of my, until I turned, until I went to college. I was raised by my aunt and uncle. I eventually called my uncle daddy because I didn't know my dad. But I still call them Catherine like Catherine because by then I was calling my mother, mother. So it's very complicated and very confusing. And I, I hope I wrote it in the book in a way that people can understand it and follow the characters. Definitely. Oh, very. I'm sorry. Yeah, Kyla, go ahead. No, just definitely. And I I um, I did find it, as I said, I found it really empowering, an empowering act. And and I see as you know, we read the book and follow the steps and the choices that you made in your education and your career and taking opportunities and, and finding them and then also taking them when they took you by surprise. Um, I, saw, I really saw the genesis of that in, in that moment on the porch with, your, with the people who raised you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And at eight, to, to know your mind, to know what you needed 
to know what you wanted. That's, I think, unusual in an eight-year-old that, that, you know, it wasn't a passing fancy oh. as your, oh, yeah. as your grandmother and mother thought by circling the block and coming back thinking you. They did. They, they, they actually left me and we went in the house next door and I was busy picking out my room and telling them what color I wanted the walls because I had always had a pink room and I didn't know it age eight that pink meant girls and blue meant boys but I was just saying I don't want a pink room again I'm tired of looking at pink and eventually we went outside and they were they had circled back they they drove around a little bit and they came back to assume that I would get in the car and I wasn't ready to get in the car so they had to take all my clothes out of the car and they went back to Ohio and I I stayed in Savannah yeah it's I I agree with Kyla it's definitely uh a symbol you know, eight year, eight year old Wanda that, you know, that will mean so much from now on when Kyle and I say that was an eight year old Wanda moment. There we go. There you go. <laughs> right. Um, Kyla, if you well, well, speaking of Wanda, um, I, one of the things that I was really struck by, and I'm hoping you can tell people about is your mother's work at the Army and Air Force Exchange Service and her impact on Mattel. I loved learning about Wanda Walker. So I was wondering, can you tell our audience about what your mother accomplished in the workspace? Because really, I think so many of us now we have her legacy before us and to thank, you know, she she changed our world, I think. And can you share about yeah. that? Yeah. So, so my mom, uh, her job when she lived in Savannah, she was uh, she worked at Fort Stewart in, in on one of the bases near Savannah. And if, at some point, she transferred from Fort Stewart to Fort, Fort Dix, working for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. It is the only organization she ever worked for. She never, ever took a job anywhere else. But she moved within that organization and became a senior executive buyer with the Army and Air Force Exchange Service, which she went from Trenton to Fort Dix to New York City to Dallas to San Francisco. She retired in San Francisco. And so as a buyer, she bought different things. Sometimes she bought luggage. Sometimes she bought clothing. um, Sometimes she bought auto parts or something like that. But at this point, when I was a a little girl, she was buying toys all the way through my first or second year in college. And she, I remember receiving a package in the mail. It was a doll about yay big. It was a big doll. It was not a tiny little thing. And it was a walking doll and it was called Wanda Walker. But the most important aspect of it was it was black. And I had never seen a doll that was black. And she, I found out later that she had something to do with the design of the doll because she was a, as a buyer, she recognized that, and you know, we were at some point we were in the, you know, we were in the Vietnam war and a lot of the soldiers and their families were black. And they should have had representation among their toys, just like everybody else. And so she made that possible. And so I, I wrote a little story about Wanda Walker because she walked kind of stiff. You know, you, you wind her up in the back and she would walk kind of stiff. And if she hit, if my grandmother had hardwood floors. And if she hit a little rut in the floor, she would fall over. <laughs> but it was fun to, to see that. I wish I had that doll today. I don't, you know, I, I guess it got tossed. Um, but at some point, she worked. She worked with Mattel, and she did not design the Black Barbie doll, but she certainly encouraged Mattel to make figures of the um, GI Joes representative mm-hmm. of the Black soldiers, as mm-hmm. well as some of the Barbie um, line later to make them. Not the first one, but eventually, she encouraged them to make black dolls and and I read in the book something like so little girls now who get to play with black dolls have Gloria Walker my mother to thank for encouraging Mattel and some of the other toy companies she had at at one point the second largest toy budget in the world after Mm -hmm. Sears and Roebuck that's and so she brought a lot of clout with her when she went to market yeah it's such an important story because it does help us realize that no matter where we are, we can we can make a difference. Uh, she didn't have to, right? She didn't have to bring something that, you know, arguably didn't have to be work-related, although she saw it as directly related, but 
we all have that in our jobs, our personal lives, in our sphere of influence. It may not be glorious sphere of influence, right? Mm -hmm. Second highest in the world in terms of budget. But yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the lesson that I learned. Like in you, in each small way, we can make a change for the better. Absolutely. Bring um, what you can. Bring what you have. Bring what you can. That's right. Absolutely. I was struck by this story, uh, the Patricias, right? The, the desegregation of high school. Um, and... I guess I have a question because, you know, when you were talking with her in 2018, and again, that 2018, you know, much like 2013 is yesterday, mm -hmm. and how, you know, you changed her name because she was afraid in 2018 still of retaliation. Can you, I, that just really s struck my heart. Like, yeah. so, we're so this is a young, here. this yeah. is a young, uh, young uh, a lady who, gosh, I guess I started, I met her in like the fourth grade. We've been friends since then. And she was one of the ones who was able to integrate public schools in Savannah in the 10th grade. Um, the NAACP reached out to a lot of families and asked those of, those of us who were, I guess, college bound on the college track, who they thought could handle that kind of situation to integrate schools, which I wanted to do, but my family was like, no, they're, they're not having it. But this, this woman did integrate schools. And I had been away from Savannah for many, many years. She, is, she never left Savannah. She stayed here, got her education here, her master's degree taught for her entire career. And I wanted to get her perspective on some of the things that went on in school when we were young, and also to talk to her about integration. And she told me these stories about some of the things that happened to her when she went to Savannah High School, which was a formerly all white school because we came from an all black school. And some of the stories were just devastating, the things that people did to her. They would, you know, her and other black students, they would trip them on the steps as they were trying to change classes. They would put banana peels in front of black students. Um, they would, um, of course, say nasty things. They couldn't sit with, they had to segregate in the cafeteria. They had to walk together to their transportation because they had to either have someone pick them up or drive them to school because they had no buses in that. They went out of the neighborhood, so there were no buses. But they had to have escorts to get to the cars. And some of the boys would make sure that they were always with the girls. And, you know, she told me some of the chants that people would say at, you know, I don't even remember. I'm not reading it right now, but they were they were making chants using the N word. Basically, mm -hmm. that's what it was. And she told me the story about a coat. She had a, a a leather coat that her parents had given her for Christmas, a white leather coat. And she and her sister both got a white leather coat. And they were so proud of this coat. Leather coats were all the rage when we were in school. And she put the coat on the back of her chair. And she sat in class. And when she got up, she heard people laughing when she put the coat back on her shoulder, you know, on her arms, on her shoulders. And she took the coat off and it had the N word written on the back with a marker. So the, the boy who was sitting behind her, presumably wrote that on the back of her white leather coat, which ruined it. She could never, ever do anything with it again. And as I was interviewing her, she said, you're not going to use my name, are you? I said, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a journalist. We always use the right names. I've never, ever allowed a reporter not to use the name. And she just forbade me. She said, if you use my name, you can't have my story. Don't. I, I said, why? She said, she said, I'm still afraid. That young man may still be around. I don't know his name. She, she may have even given it to me, but I didn't write it down. But wow. she's still fearful. And she wow. said, I don't want my name used. That is just now, so profound. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because we're here. We are in our. I guess we were in our six late sixties at the time when I interviewed her, and she still had that fear. That devastation is just. Um, yeah. This um, concept of um, sort of this DEI space that we're all in now, diversity 
equity inclusion, right? You know, your your work really is the foundation. You were doing it before it was, you know, the the sexy case du jour, right? The sexy issue that everybody is, you know, I'm not saying it's not needed. It definitely is. So I'm not making light of it in that way. But what I'm saying is you were doing this, you were doing the hard work. And so I wanted to read a quote from your book, and I'm going to ask you to unpack these words because they are words of wisdom when we're talking about the DEI space. So you said, what good is it to hire people who are different and then hold them to a standard that doesn't fit with them culturally or emotionally? And I thought, and this is, you know, you were talking in the book about sort of, you know, the push to to bring people through the pipeline, but then how retention wasn't there and how, mm -hmm. right? So if you could just unpack that because your words are very insightful for us as we are all on this same journey. One of the challenges we had in the media business is that we were counting numbers, but we weren't improving the quality of journalism. And we were certainly not improving the quality of the workplace. And so while we were bringing people in the front door, they were going out the back door. They would come in, they'd work for two years, and they'd say, forget this, I'm not going to do this, this is crazy. And so the numbers were not moving. And part of the reason for that is that we had no conversations at the beginning with those managers, those editors who were um, supervising people about how to have conversations across racial lines, about respecting people in their space, about giving people an opportunity to bring their culture to the table. That is, if I'm a Black reporter, and I'm just going to use Black History Month as an example because we're in it now, and I say, you know, there's a, there's a really good story over here of somebody who's doing something really good and they're, I don't know, they're putting up a marker for somebody who made a difference 50 years ago, or they are uh, feeding kids after school, or they, they are recognizing a pastor of a church who, you know, did something outstanding a long time ago. And the editor would say, well, nobody cares about that. Nobody wants to read that. And then you go to these meetings, I did, go to these meetings where they were considering why Black readership was low, why no one wanted to buy our papers, why perhaps in some places I wasn't in television, but perhaps black viewers, viewership was low. And you, and you wonder, you know, you sit around the table with these marketing people and they're doing all these surveys and yada, yada. And, and you go, well, duh, you're not addressing the things that they care about. And so I spent a lot of time in, you know, as part of my career, helping to not only work as an editor, but helping to have these conversations with editors and managers about some of the things that we needed to do to make people feel comfortable in the workplace, to make people want to stay, to feel valued in the workplace, and to have to communicate with our customers to find out, well, what is it that you really want to know about our community? And to show people who worked in the newsrooms I worked in another side of town by mm -hmm. literally putting them on a bus a couple of times and, and taking them on a tour to the black community and say, this is, a, this is a valuable community. People here are working class people perhaps, but they, they want the same thing everybody wants. They wanna educate their, their, fam their children. They want to raise their quality of life, their standard of life. They wanna have a good job and they wanna have peace in their lives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the reporters were not covering those communities because they did not know those communities. They did not understand those communities. They did not feel comfortable covering those communities. And so I would say in any workplace, this can, tra this can transcend outside of journalism. You really have to respect people for who they are and what they bring to the table for their culture, the cultural differences. Mm -hmm. I always like to say we should 
um, appreciate our differences. We should celebrate our differences. We are different, and that and there's no hiding that. But we really should celebrate that. Yeah, that's what makes it all a beautiful place. Uh, Kyla, well, one of the things that I was struck with um, throughout reading this, and I saw it appear in different ways, um, is is mentorship. And the reason I say different ways is, was, let me pull up, I, I wrote it out. There was a quote that you used. You say, one thing I've learned over the years is that you never know where or when the next opportunity is coming. You may meet someone or work with someone who drops your name in a conversation. And this was in relationship to your call from Larry Jinks, but it reads like mentoring, which you which you did throughout your career. I know that you are still continuing to do that, as we talked to you about before. And we have a uh, uh, courting with us in, in viewing and asking questions. And so can you talk about the the gift of mentorship um and and i think it relates to what what you're talking about making space and and um providing opportunities for people sure well you know <clears throat> excuse me um i didn't have any mentors when i was young i didn't i didn't even know what that was because there were no women no people of color no one sort of took me by the hand except my teachers um and my parents my family of course but people in the business i'm I used to say I'm the oldest black journalist I know. Now I've met mm -hmm. some journalists who are older since then, but I'm in that generation where we sort of mentored each other because there were no people older than us to mentor us who were African American. And while I have had white mentors and mm -hmm. I'm very proud of that, I didn't early in my career, possibly because I didn't know I needed it because nobody ever told me that. Um, so it's very important. I always tell people, you never know who's watching you. You never know what impact you're having on someone. You don't have to just sit down and have a conversation with someone to be a mentor. A lot of times people, you're mentoring just by people watching you and seeing how you're doing something, how you're handling uh, running a meeting, for example, which a lot of people have told me they watched me run meetings. They watched my my demeanor, which is generally calm in my management style. I'm not a I'm not a screamer. I don't go around the, the newsroom banging on the desk like a lot of people used to do. Um, and so people do watch. They watch and they, they pick up your your mannerisms. They pick up your traits. They pick up the way you handle situations. And when I was inducted into the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame, my acceptance speech was people are watching. And I didn't realize how much people were watching until it was announced that I was going to be inducted. The time between when they put out the press release and said, you're going to be in, Wanda Lewis is going to be inducted. And then, you know, maybe six weeks later when I actually went to the, um, to the banquet where they gave me the award, people started emailing me and calling me and texting me and putting it on social media. I've been watching you all your career. I love the way you did this or that. Mm -hmm. People kept saying, I've been watching you. Wow. And there were people watching me that I didn't even know. And so I tell people who are in a space where they can be mentors, don't just think about the conversations you're having with people, but understand that people really are watching you. Now, having said that, I do a lot of mentoring. I, I, you know, people call me, especially people in journalism, some now in, in nonfiction writing, um, people call and ask my advice on how to handle certain situations. And I've enjoyed that throughout my career. So I have what I used to call my children. I guess I can still call them that, you know, I have a daughter, but I have my children. There are probably hundreds of them who um, I've mentored over the years and, and helped them in so many ways. And I'm very proud of them. And the most important thing I tell them is to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to do the same thing. I was actually struck by that. I actually wrote this down, this concept of paying it forward for the next generation, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really recognizing. Kyla. Well, I will say this, um, we're already getting a number of audience questions, and um, I think I'm going to ask you one, but let me just say this for people who are listening. Please type in any questions that you have, um, and I'll share them on the screen. We take audience questions about 745. We'll start putting them up. But I did get one that was actually texted to me um, because it, it just wasn't going through on the chat. And it says, um, hi, Wanda, you have worked diligently and passionately throughout your career to make sure women and people of color have a seat at the table. What is your advice for grabbing a plate and digging in? In other words, for making our voices heard and feeling comfortable with that. 
Well, you know, I, I didn't make my voice heard early in my career. I was scared to death because I had grown up in this all black society where I was scared of white people because I'd never been around them. And, I, and nobody ever told me how to act around white people. And so, you know, younger people now have that advantage that they've grown up with different people of different cultures. And so the first thing is to understand how much value you bring to any situation, whether it's a, a conversation or a work project. You know, I, I would say your voice needs to say, well, wait a minute, are we representing everyone who works in this place? Or are we representing all of our all of our customers or our, or our potential customers? You know, you need to bring your voice to the table to save these things. Um, don't be afraid of, of 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 speaking up in meetings, which was a challenge for me. But then I ended up running meetings at USA Today, <laughs> so I became more of a, a, a spokesperson. So I guess that's the answer that I would have for that. Um. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask um, before we, and I, like Kyla said, I know we have lots of questions, but your part in the book about the O.J. Simpson trial and um, the, the views and what that was like in the workplace, what that meant, mm -hmm. it, it was, it's very complex. It really is. The, the, for those who are young enough that they don't, weren't around for the, or don't remember this, the O.J. Simpson trial uh, where he allegedly killed his ex-wife and her friend w went on for weeks. It just went on and on and on. And in the newsroom, we were making plans throughout the whole trial for how we would, um, what, when the verdict came in, how, what space we would give it in the newspaper, if, it, if the verdict came down at, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, we'd have one plan. If it came down at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the evening, you know, depending on the space and everything else going on in the world. And so we just spent a lot of time talking about how we would cover this trial. And so sure enough, when the trial, the verdict came, I believe it was in the afternoon. My office was on the 15th floor and the news part of the newsroom was on the 14th floor. And so I went to the 14th floor because I wanted to be in the newsroom when the verdict came down. And everybody else sort of naturally gravitated. You know, people from sports came to news. People from features came to news because we wanted to experience it. And the USA Today newsroom was, had televisions all over the place. So we were in Roslyn, Virginia, watching it on television. And... It, it, the room was quiet as the first verdict was read. And the verdict was not guilty. You could hear a pin drop. And all of a sudden, I could hear someone on one side of me doing a little sniffing. I could hear someone crying. A young white woman who was an editor. And I just was still, I didn't want to look at her in her direction. But I knew who it, I knew who it was. I know her name today. I remember her name. And then the other verdict came and someone in another part of the room, same thing, another white woman was crying. And it, sh it stunned me that these white women, it, that was the first time I realized how much white women were identifying with, what was her name? I can't remember her name. Nicole. Um, Nicole. Yeah. Nicole. Brown, uh, yeah. Nicole, Nicole Brown Simpson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or Brown, I guess. She, she was divorced. Mm -hmm. And so when the second verdict was read, instead of staying in the newsroom and having conversations about it, I, I went back to my office on the fifth floor, 15th floor. And my, I, my back was to the door because I just went to my computer to read the Associated Press wire about what was going on in, on the trial. And all of a sudden, I could feel a presence behind me. And I looked around and there was a black person, one of our staff members, was in my office and then another one and then another one and then another one. And then I heard somebody slam my door. And what I realized was that all the black people wanted to come and sort of sort of celebrate that um, Simpson, O.J. Simpson had won this trial because he had enough money to pay the best for the best legal defense. And even though, quite frankly, most of us believed that he was guilty, he was able to get out of it. And so that's when we realized this division in the newsroom, this black, white, 
chasm in the newsroom that black people were happy for Simpson and white women especially were very, very sad because they felt like Nicole Brown did not get her day in court. And we really needed to do something about that. And so the editor of the paper at the time, Peter Pritchett was his, is his name, um, asked me to call a, a collect our staff members in, in groups. And we had to have some conversations. We even brought in a I don't know what you would call it in this DEI world, but we call someone, they used to call them a sensitivity session, somebody to okay. facilitate a conversation. We brought someone professional in to facilitate conversations with our staff because people were not able to have these conversations across racial lines. And then, of course, one of the most important things we did is we assigned a story, a reporter to a story to write about it nationally because it wasn't just in our newsroom. It was all over the country in yeah. workplaces all over the country. A fascinating time and just how a story really unmasks or unveils things that we're not aware of about each other, the lens that we each look through. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Kyla, are there some yeah, questions? Actually, you know, I always have lots. Well, no, I mean, we could, I have a whole sheet behind the screen, you know, with, yeah. with lots of questions, but we do have um, some from the audience. So one of, um, so one, we have some, some regular, wonderful guests for our programming and one of the ultimate super fans of Prince George's County Memorial Library System. And I like to think also our office, the Office of Human Rights is Miss Vivian and she comes to all of our events and she is wondering where you got the plaques behind you. Oh, these are um, African masks that my husband and I have collected over the years. We have not been to Africa, but we've always thought it was important in our home to have uh, cultural icons. So we have artwork, we have African um, stuff. Over on my right side, there's a drum, which he plays occasionally just for fun. Um, we have books that are written by Black authors, most of them, many of them signed. Um, black music. So our our house is is a a cultural uh, oasis for us. It it expresses us as African Americans, Lovely. and so we got them from different places. In places in different cities, we got some in. Uh, we lived in Nashville. The one behind me that's the, on a stand here yeah. came from a, a shop in Nashville. Um, the little drum next to it. I think I bought it in Montgomery when I went to visit my publisher, New South Books. There's a little African shop there. Some of them came from Greenville, South Carolina, where there was a wonderful African shop on Main Street. So different places. That's Thank awesome. You. And, and then we have uh, we have another one from our, our friend Courtney who asks. Uh, so first of all, hi Courtney. Um, was the transition from editor to memoirist a difficult one? Well, hi Courtney. Courtney is my Spelman College friend. Um, it wasn't difficult, but it, it certainly took some work. Um, being a journalist, first of all, I was an editor and not a full-time reporter. Uh, I supervised reporters, but I learned how to write in the style of journalism. So it was, you know, it was quick and crisp and clear and factual and without what we call color in non-editor non fiction or, or in novels. And so I had to learn how to do that. Um, and it took a few tries. My friend Tina Macaron, so who you mentioned in the um, in the introduction, and who um, she calls herself my hype woman when I was writing the memoir. Uh, but we had several meetings and sessions on the phone where she told she you know she gave me some instruction about how to write uh, stories in the nonfiction genre. And sometimes I would send her chapters. And she would say, okay, you write like a journalist. I want you to stop it. And so we had conversations about how to, how to put color in stories, how to talk about details of what was going on, how to talk about what was going on in the world, not just in my life, but what was going on in the world. What was this, what was this whole world of Jim Crow like? I had to read, I read probably three dozen books while I was before and while I was writing the book because I, I read slave narratives because I needed to understand what it was, what what our people went through. I had to understand that. I I understood what we went through, but I knew it was much worse for in, in, for those who were enslaved, and I needed to understand that. I also 
read books from uh, Reconstruction and Jim Crow because I needed to understand what it was like in the mind of people who were lawmakers who would write laws about Jim Crow to prevent us from having just some basic civil rights. And, and, and that helped me a lot. And then I, wrote, I read some, uh, some, some other memoirs also. That's great. That's really helpful. And great to see you, Courtney Duke. Yeah, and she. Oh, do you? You probably know each other too. Everybody knows Courtney. Um. So there's another. Actually, Courtney. Courtney has a question about Smallman. I actually wanted to ask about Smallman too because I see how important it is. So let me put this one up. As a graduate of the great Smallman College, says Courtney, would you share your thoughts on the importance of HBCUs then and now? Wow, Courtney. I just wrote a column. Uh, I write for my local paper, and I just wrote a column last week about HBCUs because this whole situation with these bomb scares. I just, I just, I don't even want to think about what could happen. Um, HBCUs are incredibly important. When I was writing the book, one of the one of the um, references I went to, one of the first references I went to was my high school yearbook, my senior yearbook. And one of the things I discovered, because you know we we had the yearbook. Heck, I was on the yearbook staff, and I didn't remember half the stuff that was in there. Um, but one of the things I discovered is that all of our teachers went to HBCUs to get their undergraduate education. And almost all of our teachers went to big schools in the Northeast to get their graduate education. They went to NYU and Columbia and um, University of Pittsburgh and Brown University. And that's where I discovered that the state of Georgia paid all of their expenses to leave the state and go to these universities because they could not go to the University of Georgia and get their graduate degrees. They just wouldn't allow that. So HBCUs are incredibly important in terms of creating a population of intelligentsia in the South, in the communities where the schools are and across the country. HBCUs at one time educated almost all of the black doctors in the United States because among the HBCUs, are Howard Medical School and uh, Meharry School of Medicine, College, uh, Meharry uh, College, I think it's College of Medicine. Um, the pride of, of going to an HBCU with people who are like us, where we could get our education and not have to worry about all that other stuff, which is what my parents didn't want me to have to do. They didn't want me to go to University of Georgia, even though Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes had gone to University of Georgia while I was in high school. I wanted to go to University of Georgia just because it was the only journalism major in the state of Georgia. And my folks said, no, you're not going to the University of Georgia. We want you to go to an HBCU, Spelman in particular, because um, we want you to get a good education and have a good experience in school. And I, and I appreciate that. And I was able to get a journalism, have a journalism career in spite of not having a journalism major in school. Um, Everywhere there's an HBCU, you will find a community of people who have a lot of pride in our, in our culture. You know, we know the same music. We know the same, we've read some of the same books, some of the same authors, theater, dance, just culture in general, very important. And in some ways, and I don't fault them for this, but a lot of the younger students who don't get to go to an HBCU are missing that cultural foundation. If, if they, if they, I'm assuming that all young people go to integrated schools now, although not necessarily in the South. Um, but if they don't go to an HBCU, they may miss it because it's just not happening in what we call the PWIs, predominantly white institutions. Thank you very much. Do you have, um... Oh, here we got. Here we go, Tina. All right. Do you, um, Renee? Do you have a question? Because I know we're getting a little close to time, so I want you to make sure that you get you get one in. Hey, Tina. Tina is my classmate. For she just said class of seventy one. Yeah. She's listening. Oh, Renee, you were muted, bud. Thank you. Two years, and I still haven't, you know, yeah. learned how to unmute. Um, I was struck towards the end of your book. Your your 
narrative about the racist emails when you were at the Montgomery County, uh, Mo Montgomery County, <laughs> that's very Maryland, the Montgomery, <laughs> Alabama uh, newspaper. And very disconcerting, but perhaps not given the climate um, that we now live in. But if you could just share a little bit about that and, and really, you know, the devastation, why, why it was so devastating. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really struggled about whether to include that story in the book because I didn't want this to be a book of um, poor me or sadness. I wanted it to be a book of uplifting stories about how I got from Jim Crow to journalism. But I, I saved all the emails and all the documentation on that story. And I said, you know, God must have really wanted me to put this somewhere. And so I did. So there was a, uh, it, 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 the situation that I'm going to describe really is the only time that I ever had a meltdown in my entire career. There was a gentleman, a, well, purportedly a gentleman, we never know who, who this was, that was sending emails to me. I thought it was only to me. I later learned he was sending them to a lot of people in the newsroom, uh, calling me racist names, using the N-word, um, saying that we were turning the paper into, and I'm just paraphrasing, a black paper. Um, and just disparaging me personally for doing that. Which, of course, I was the editor, so I take responsibility for that. But I also was the editor representing a corporate entity that wanted me to make sure the paper reflected the entire community. And that's a large reason why I was there. Um, and at some point when I realized that everybody was seeing the emails and they just kept coming day after day after day, one day I went downstairs to the HR department, human resources, and I just sort of fell into the chair of uh, this lady in, the, in that department and started sobbing, uncontrollably sobbing. She had no idea what had happened. Um, she sat next to me in the chair next to me and she just had to hold me and keep me from shaking. I was shaking so much. And at some point when I was able to say anything, I said, go ask Scott, that's the name of our publisher. Um, he, he was aware of all of it. And she said, I think you need to leave the building. You don't need to go back to the newsroom. And she walked me out. She went back to the newsroom and got my got my handbag because my keys were in it. And she walked me out through the back door, through the through another department so that I didn't go through the newsroom to my car. And I was gone for a few hours. I went home and sort of consoled myself. Happened to be a time when my husband was traveling. He was in California visiting his brother who was uh, in the hospital. And so I was living at home by my, I was at home by myself. Our daughter was in, co uh, in college. No, she was out of college. She was, she was not living there. And I thought about staying home. But then at some point in the afternoon, I said, you know what? I'm going back to, to the office. I'm not going to let this get me down. And so instead of going to the newsroom, I went to Scott's office, the publisher. And he was aware of what had happened. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to go back to work. And he walked me across the hall to the newsroom and he called, we called everybody together. We had a little bell in the newsroom. Everybody gathered around. And he said, I know that you're all aware that these new, these emails have been uh, going around. And I want you to know that Wanda has my support. She is the editor of this paper. She will remain the editor of this newspaper and she has my support. And we will continue, continue to cover this community the way we have covered it under her leadership. And then he went back to his office and I went to my office and nothing was ever said about it. But I, it took all of that to help me to realize that this, that the whole community was not friendly to what I was trying to do. I mean, I knew it anyway. I'd heard from others on a, a, a less strident way over those years, but that was the one that really just made me realize that this world is not changing very fast. Yeah, it seems sometimes, you know, two steps forward and yeah, that many back. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. But that's why that's why I think, you know, as your book point, we, we all have personal responsibility in this, all of us. Yeah. It doesn't matter what color, what education, what social economic, we all have a responsibility in this thing that we call life, this journey that we're on together. So mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed this so much. Um I'm gonna turn it over to Kyla. Well, this is really this has been great. And it, we are at the we are at the close. We've run out of time, which is too bad because we could keep talking to you for ages and maybe we could have you back one day with your new that would be great. New book. That would be that would be fantastic. And yes, yeah, so Renee right now is holding the book up. What is the best way that you can help authors you buy the book? Oh, sure. And so well, we will sure. oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was gonna say. Uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all the online sellers have it. Uh, I don't know what stores it's in because uh, it has been out a couple of years. Um, I have a website. A few people do buy it from me if they want to sign copy. So you can go to WandaLloyd.com if you want to sign copy. We'll add the cost of shipping it. And I, I ship several times a week for those who want signed copies. Um, and it's on, e it's a Kindle, it's an ebook, and also on Audible. So there you go. There's lots of different ways to get this. So so um, get your copy if you haven't had a chance to get it yet. And I just put it up on the screen, WandaLloyd.com. Oh, you, you can get your signed copy there, which would be fantastic. Um, so for everybody watching, I do want to let you know about a few things we have coming up. We always have lots of great events coming up with our friends, the library system. So first of all, thank you, library, for the use of all of your technology once again tonight and for your wonderful partnership that you do with us over and over again so that we can reach the residents of Prince George's County and beyond. We really appreciate the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Uh, we have um, another New South book author coming next week. Cole, uh, Dr. Cole Manley is coming to talk about the unlikely world of the Montgomery bus boycott. In the beginning of March, we were doing this book, The Salinization of America with Cynthia Tucker and Fry Gaylord. Um, and our diversity dialogue starts back up for 2022 on February 22nd. You can join me and Michelle Hamill from the library system with the Elephant We Don't See Diversity Dialogue on Tuesday, February 22nd. Um, for all that and more, you can check out pgcmls.info slash events or come to our webpage at, I want to get it this time, Renee, tidyurl.com slash PGC OHR events. And uh, or been, you could probably just Google Office right. of Human Rights. That would be better than trying to keep track of everything I've just said. Um, but it's been so wonderful. And Wanda, thank you so much for your time and being with us tonight. It's really been a fantastic conversation. We appreciate it, it so much. It has been my pleasure. It has been my pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And good night. Stay safe.